So thank you everyone and welcome to Social Sciences Week. It's so great to have all of you here. It's so lovely you could join us today. And this, uh, this webinar is called Enhancing Metadata for Inclusive Research on Entrenched Dis Disadvantage. Um, it should be presented by Jenny Fuster as well as Professor Wojciech Tomczewski and Dr. Matthew Curry. Unfortunately, um, Jenny sends her apologies. She's not, I'm unable to meet it today uh, to join us today. So I'll be um, I'll be speaking on on her behalf. But before we get started, I would like to uh, recognise uh, elders, both past and present, and emerging leaders here and across Australia. And I want to acknowledge their enduring connection and relationships in in reciprocity, in reciprocity to the land, seas and the skies above. I also want to acknowledge any Indigenous people uh, here today. And if you have, uh, if you would like to share where you're joining us from, please feel welcome to uh, share the country you're joining us from in the chat. And I'd also like to acknowledge any Indigenous peoples joining us today. I'd also like to acknowledge Dylan Sara, the Gurungurung artist. Um, who's responsible for the Indigenous iconography that's used in this presentation in some of our slides. Excellent. So, so today, um, thank you for joining us. And uh, I'm Mary Filsell. I'm a data consultant from the engagements team at the Australian Research Data Commons, otherwise known as the ARDC. Uh, I'm stepping in for Jenny, uh, as I just mentioned, who's the director of the Hassan Indigenous Research Data Commons. She's an apology today due to illness. But let's start with a bit of housekeeping. Um, so please keep your mics muted during the presentations and please be aware that we're recording today and that both the recording and the slides will be made available for those that are registered for this webinar. And we'll also have an opportunity after the presentation for questions. So please feel very welcome to enter your questions into the chat and we'll do our best to get to all questions today. And let's just begin uh, now with, um, with a little bit of background on the ARDC. So the ARDC has over 100 staff based at host institutions all around Australia and 26 member institutions. And if you don't see your logo here and you'd like to talk to us about becoming uh, one of our members, uh, please get in touch. Um, our email address is contact at ardc.edu.au. I'll provide that link in the chat um, a little bit further along during this presentation. Excellent. And the ARDC was established under the Australian Government's National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy. Otherwise, we call it NCRIS. So you might hear that acronym uh, spoken a lot. And that was in 2019. So the ARDC was created from three earlier um, data-focused national digital research infrastructure organisations. And those are the, A, the Australian National Data Service, um, otherwise uh, spoken as an acronym as ANS, NECTA, and the Research Data Services, um, known as RDS. So we are now a not-for-profit company limited by guarantee, which along with 25 other organisations supported by NCRIS that you can see here, um, provide national research infrastructure for Australian researchers. All right, so at the ARDC, our purpose is to provide Australian researchers with competitive advantage through data. And um, one of the ways that we're doing this is through the thematic uh, research data commons. So many of you recall the ARDC quite a while ago undertaking lots of open call processes for national data assets, platforms, and so on. And from the work that we did on these open calls, it became clear that we couldn't meet the demand of the research community for digital research infrastructure. So our new strategy is based around the concept of a thematic research data commons that enables us to support maximum number of researchers through a small number of strategic priority areas. And so the first of these that's come into being um, was the HASS and Indigenous RDC. And you might be saying to yourself, oh, okay, but what is a research data commons? So a research data commons derives from the medieval European idea of the management of shared land and was later popularized as a way of referring to shared resources. So a research data commons brings together people, skills, data and related resources such as compute, software, uh, models, uh, all into the one system. 
So by providing integrated resources and easy to use interfaces, it enables researchers to speed up their existing research and to undertake research that wasn't possible before. And so we're here as part of the House and Indigenous Research Data Commons. And so the Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences or HASS and Indigenous Research Data Commons um, is, is, is what we see here on this screen. So now I'm gonna give you a quick update on where we're up to with the Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences and Indigenous Research Data Commons. Uh, we often call it the HASS and I, whoops, RDC. So I'll provide some background about how we came about into the portfolio of work that we've undertaken to date. So the 2016 National Research Infrastructure Roadmap identified opportunities to accelerate the impact of the House and Indigenous research. And it recommended improving the overall coordination of research infrastructure that supports access to and analysis of physical and digital collections using tools such as digitization, aggregation and interpretation of platforms. So the Australian Government Department of Education subsequently commissioned three studies that identified a number of investment ready programs that would benefit from the National Research Infrastructure funding. And you can uh, download all these scoping studies from the ARDC website. Uh, and while not all of the recommendations from those scoping studies were funded at the time, the activities embarked enabled us to uh, start this initial round of development, which, which displayed an advanced state of readiness to participate in and benefit from a House and Indigenous RDC. So you can see those here on the screen. So those activities are improving Indigenous research capabilities, the ARDC Community Data Lab, uh, the Language Data Commons of Australia, and the Integrated Research Infrastructure for Social Sciences. So you can learn uh, more from our website or just uh, I will put I'll put that in the in the chat in just a moment, and and yes. So and now, um, now we in twenty twenty three the ARDC led Hass and Indigenous RDC received the largest ever investment in research infrastructure in Australia. So this is this is massive. So there was a twenty five million dollar grant from the Australian government's twenty twenty three National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy or NCRIS in that funding round, along with co-investment from national partners. And this will continue to deliver long-term enduring national digital research infrastructure to support Hass and Indigenous researchers in Australia. So this is, this is massive. And as such, we intend to continue our support for IIRC, uh, the Language Data Commons of Australia, the Community Data Lab and Social Sciences. We have also expanded um, the RDC to include two new focus areas, Australian Creative Histories and Futures and the Australian Internet Alts Observatory. Our connections focus area will continue the works of the HASS uh, and Indigenous Community Data Lab, as well as securing at-risk data and exposing GLAM data for HASS and Indigenous research. And so, here we are. So we've also continued our commitment to the social sciences and most recently with the pilot project enhancing metadata for inclusive research on entrenched disadvantage, which you will hear more about from Professor Wojciech Tomaszewski and Dr. Matthew Curry from UQ. So allow me to finally introduce now our key speakers for today's webinar. So Professor Wojciech Tomaszewski is Deputy, Deputy Director of Research and a Research Group Leader at the Institute for Social Science Research and is also Chief Investigator and Program Leader in the Australian Research Council or the ARC, Centre for Excellence for Children and Families over the Life Course, the Life Course Centre. And Dr Matthew Curry is a Research Fellow at the Institute for Social Science Research at University of Queensland. He's a sociologist, whose research focuses primarily on inequalities, stratification and mobility in labour markets, education and social disadvantage. So I'm going to pass now over to you, um, Wojciech. Thank you, Mary, for the uh, introduction. Yeah, as Mary said, my name is uh, Wojciech Tomaszewski and I'll be presenting today together with my colleague, uh, Matthew Curry. Um, and we can move to the next slide, please. 
Uh, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are all meeting today. And for me here in Mianjin or Brisbane, these are the Yagar and Turbo peoples. And I would like to acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging, and would also like to acknowledge any First Nations colleagues who are with us today. And we can move to the next slide, please. So this project was designed in the context of a rapid expansion of the data infrastructure in the social sciences in Australia, and in particular, the emergence over the last years of integrated government administrative data that are available to researchers and which weren't available only a few years ago. And to fully capitalize on these new data assets, researchers and need access to high quality metadata and documentation to be able to work with these data. So for uh, the people here who might not be very familiar with the term metadata, what we are talking about is data about data. And we are taking quite a broad definition here. So we mean all the documentation that helps the researchers to make sense of the data, including things like data dictionaries, data linkage reports, technical notes, explanatory notes that provide additional information about things like the background or context to the data or describe changes over time to the variables included in the data and so on. And we can move to the next slide, please. So just to let you know how we got here. So the project was coped up following a co-design process facilitated by the ARDC. And this is a typical uh, process that happens on the projects that ARDC co-invests in. So this involved two consultation sessions where a number of stakeholders from across the sector discussed some of the most pressing needs that social science, um, social science researchers in Australia face today in terms of research infrastructure needs. And the goal was to scope up a relatively contained project that would be feasible to deliver within a short six months time frame. So following this co-design process, improvements in metadata for integrated administrative data emerged as the preferred focus area. Um, and this is because uh, of the potential impacts, but also of the perceived feasibility to, to deliver something within this short time frame. And specifically, we chose to focus on the higher education administrative data within the person level integrated data asset or PLIDA, which was formerly, um, formerly known as the Multi-Agency Data Integration Project or MADI. And just to give you a little bit of information about the PLIDA data asset, it provides access to de-identified individual level administrative records from the Australian Bureau of Statistics or the ABS, and crucially the census data and a number of other uh, government agencies, the Australian Taxation Office, ATO, the Department of Education, including the higher education data that we looked at uh, as part of this project, the Department of Health, Department of Social Services, Services Australia, so central link data, for example, and the Department of Home Affairs. So all of this data gets combined by the, AB, by the ABS, de-identified, and is being made available through the ABS Secure Data Analysis Environment called the Data Lab. And we focus specifically on metadata for the higher education data, partially because it captures educational disadvantage, uh, which was in line with the substantive focus of the project, which was entrenched disadvantage. And it was also driven by the project partners who emerged. So in, in addition to UQ as the project lead and the ARDC, uh, we also, um, the partners also included the ABS, the Department of Education and the ARC Center of Excellence for Children and Families over the Life Course or the Life Course Center. And we can uh, move to the next slide, please. So just to give you a brief overview of the project components, uh, we structured the work around five work packages. So the uh, first work package provided a review of good practice in metadata documentation using desk-based uh, research. Uh, work package two included a review of higher education metadata in PLIDA and its provenance. Uh, work package three focused on user experience consultations. Work package four um, involves solution design and forward plan, including um, recommendations. And the last work package, work package five, designed a monitoring plan to measure long-term outcomes of metadata improvements. Um, and I will now hand over to Matthew, uh, who will take you through the first three work packages, and then I will come back to talk about the last two work packages and then uh, to wrap up. Hi, yeah, can we get that? Thanks, Mary. Um, 
Hi, everyone. So I'm, I'm Matthew Curry. And, and as Wojtek mentioned, I'll be speaking to the first um, three of our work packages. And so um, for our review of kind of good practice in metadata documentation, um, and really for this whole project, um, we oriented things around the needs of researchers who, as the kind of end users of this type of integrated administrative social science data. And so this is in contrast to a lot of the published work which looks at metadata from the perspective of information professionals um, who are the ones um, archiving the data or maybe even creating the data um, rather than just researchers who want to have a good enough understanding of the data so that they can answer their kind of social science questions um, correctly and with confidence. Um, and so the first part of, of this was to review um, attributes for assessing data quality from metadata. And so there were focused on five dimensions um, and these included information about um, the institutional environment. So things like the purpose and process of data collection, um, the, the relevance, so the demographic or conceptual relevance of the data for, um, for researchers, um, the timeliness of the data. So, you know, when was it collected? When is it actually released for use? Um, the accuracy, so things such as um, processing or collection, data collection errors, um, and then coherence, which um, has to do with comparability with other collections or over time. So like if there are changes in policy um, that might affect the comparability of data or data collection, even within the same um, topical area over time, things like that. Um, and then we also considered um, interpretability um, and accessibility. Um, and then we also kind of looked specifically from, um, from researchers' point of views and um, were thinking about the like their metadata needs. Um, and so those things in included um, information to help understand the data. Um, so things like um, documenting the data collection details, and a lot of these overlap with the first. Um, providing variable level descriptions. So descriptions of each variable that are meaningful to the researchers, um, like codes on or um, informative codes uh, for numeric variables or categorical variables, um, discussions of limitations um, and data analysis recommendations um, provided to the users. Um, and then information about how to access the data, the procedures involved with that. Um, and then finally, um, information about the metadata itself. So um, understanding the origin of the metadata, how often the metadata is updated or maintained, um, and who's responsible for that. Um, next slide. Thanks. Um, and so the kind of second part of this of this work package um, were considering all of the things mentioned previously and and identifying is if existing metadata standards. Um, that satisfy the needs of researchers um, as users of the data. And so the Data Documentation Initiative, or DDI, um, provides an example um, of a metadata standard that covers many of those concerns. Um, and we also reviewed several examples of integrated administrative data um, to look at how they have created their own metadata. Um, and so these included mostly international sources um, of, it, of administrative data. Um, and we also looked at the HILDA survey, which is an Australian household survey, um, as a benchmark due to its longitudinal nature, which is similar to the PLIDA asset, um, and its coverage of many of the same topical domains um, as PLIDA. And the metadata example we found, and there's more details of this um, in our actual like full reporting, but the metadata example we found that kind of best met the needs of data analysts um, was the HILDA survey. And part of that is because it's created specifically for research use, um, as opposed to a lot of the administrative data, which is really created for other purposes. Um, but it was both well-organized and responsive um, to a, a wide range of the needs in terms of content. So there was lots of information on the access, the provenance. Um, there was a lot of micro-level data information about each variable. Um, data quality issues and technical papers advising on how best to, um, you know, link different data files together or how to um, 
think about the sample or analyze it um, is all there, um, which again is in contrast to most of the other examples that, that we looked at. Um, next slide. Um, our second uh, work package was a review of the higher education metadata that, that does exist within the, the PLIDA higher education module. Um, and so there we were um, reviewing the metadata and documentational documentation that is available inside Data Lab, which as Wojtek mentioned, is the kind of secure environment where researchers will actually interact with, uh, with the PLIDA data. Um, and then we also reviewed metadata that's available outside of Data Lab, so that you generally is available on um, government department websites or um, sometimes in, in other reports. Um, and then we also did a few targeted consultations with data custodians and providers of the original data. Um, so these included like people at the universities who are actually submitting the reporting data to the Department of Education. Um, next slide. And uh, sorry, back one. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so we found that the avail available metadata does a relatively good job of um, including information about variable and value definitions. Um, though there are some small gaps where codes um, in the data itself would be unexplained in Data Lab, for example. Um, but um, kind of a bigger issue is that the metadata is fragment fragmented. So it's not available in a single place and some of it's not widely accessible or easily findable. Um, and it's often designed for purposes other than for social science researchers. So it might be designed for the reporting, the people that have the reporting requirements from universities. Um, and then there's some information um, which we have identified from work package one that would be um, really helpful to to um, researchers, but just what which just is not available at all. And so these includes include assessments of data quality and limitations, um, advice, uh, data analysis advice, um, things like that. Um, next slide, please, Mary. Um, and so our third work package. Um, again, kind of along this theme of, of orienting things around the um, perspective of researchers as, as end users um, were consultations with um, experienced PLIDA users. Um, and so we really had uh, wanted to focus on researchers' perceptions and experiences. Um, we had three main questions uh, for this kind of work package. So how do researchers build their, who have experience using PLIDA? Um, how do they build their understanding of the data? Uh, what do they perceive as strengths and weaknesses of the metadata? And then what are their recommendations for improvements that would make their lives as researchers easier and um, crucially also help people who are starting out who, who haven't yet built that understanding over time of the PLIDA data? Um, and so we had great interest from PLIDA users. So we originally aimed for, um, we, we were going to try to talk to eight or 10 people. Um, we kind of put the call out to various um, researchers that we knew of and some government departments. And we ended up with 20 people wanting to talk to us. We actually had to cut people off because we ran out of time. And so anyone who's done this kind of work where you're reaching out to people and taking time out of their day, getting double what you asked for is very rare. And so I think our first kind of finding was that this is important to people. Um, and it really affects their um, their work. Um, next um, slide, please. And so um, some just brief things of what we found were, one is that um, the researchers had built their knowledge of the PLIDA data in ways that were really not straightforward. Um, and they required resources outside the kind of standard metadata that was included um, that came like alongside the data. Um, so they couldn't rely only on that. Um, instead, they relied a lot on personal experience. So this often came over years or even decades of working with the PLIDA data itself um, or similar data to slowly build an understanding. Um, and they also use personal and professional networks. Um, and so they would get in contact with key people, um, but often it's not clear who those right people are, like who actually has the best understanding of the data. And sometimes these networks are built from 
like having past experience, like literally working within the Department of Education or knowing people who are on the university stats team that actually produce the data. Um, and oftentimes they would also reach out directly to data custodians in and get information that was not always publicly available or certainly very easily findable. And so these are like very idiot, everyone kind of had idiosyncratic ways of building up their understanding of the data over time. Um, and then they also had, in general, very positive things to say about the ABS and the data lab environment and um, data custodians who provide all this data to Plida because it's really allowed for research that couldn't have been done you know, a few years ago. And so they really went out of their way to praise the ABS and to data and the data lab and understand that resource constraints and the kind of inherently messy nature of administrative data and legal privacy constraints um, and the needs to keep releasing updated data, they kind of push metadata curation down the list of priorities um, for, for the data custodians. Um, and they've also found data lab and ABS staff and the staff at data custodians to be very helpful in general um, with, with trying to kind of um, augment the, the existing metadata to help them understand it and help them do their work in ways that are you know, accurate. Um, and they also found the data item list. So these are things like basically data dictionaries, which list out the variables, list out the code, um, the values of the, the coded variables to be really, in general, pretty complete. Um, and they also found um, like metadata outside of data lab to be helpful as well. So things that come from um, the Department of Education rather than the PLIDA environment. Um, but they also you know, mentioned several areas for improvement. And so one of the main things was the accessibility of information. Um, and so particularly for new or inexperienced researchers, um, a lot of the information only exists after you get access to the to the platform, which means you have to propose a project before you know if you can do it and go through the steps of getting access before you know if you'll really be able to do it well. Um, and then also how things are organized. So both inside Data Lab, where, where all the it would basically be nice to have um, all of the various metadata resources like organized intuitively, organized centrally, um, so that people know um, where to go if they need more information about the data. And, and if they can't find it there, they know that it doesn't exist somewhere else. Um, another thing that they mentioned were was context contextual information to ensure the proper interpretation of their results um, and like a clear understanding of who's in the sample and who's not. Um, and then uh, the last couple of last couple of things were kind of um, ensuring that the completeness of the of the metadata resources that do exist and, and kind of ensuring their maintenance over time, um, and then understanding how all the various modules and all the pieces within Plida, which is this very complex data asset, understanding how those all fit together and how the different pieces of it link together, um, in ways to ensure that they're not misinterpreting you know, their final results. Um, and then, so all of these things um, have a very real impact on productivity, right? So each person having to go out and kind of build their own understanding, again, in these like idiosyncratic ways um, to test things out, to try to reverse engineer mistakes and figure out what's going on because there's not clear documentation. All that takes time and effort and it increases the startup costs for new researchers. Um, and so it's it's a drag on um, researcher efficiency and and kind of adds to um, to researchers' workloads. And so you know they they all expressed um, a real uh, need um, or desire to iron out kind of as many of these things and standardize as many of these issues um, as possible. Um, so I might hand it back to Voitech now and and move on to work package four. Yeah, thanks, Marius. So yeah, so um, thanks, Matt. That that was that was great overview and and a bit of a taste for the um the findings, I think, as well. So, uh, look, I mean, the this work package uh for was dedicated to developing uh, recommendations for metadata improvements in Plida with a particular focus on higher education data because uh, that was the the focus of the. 
project. So we started with a synthesis of the work undertaken across the first three work packages that uh, Matt has just talked about. Um, and we also run additional consultations to test the draft recommendations. So there were two kinds of uh, consultations at this stage. First with users to assess the completeness of the recommendations, of the draft recommendations that we, we proposed, and then to gauge the priorities from the user perspective. So what needs to be done first. Um, and then a set of consultations with the ABS to test the uh, feasibility of the recommendations, particularly in the context of the data lab environment, and also gauge which of the recommendations might be the first to be implemented in terms of the kind of uh, plans that might already be in place. Um, and through those consultations, we actually confirmed that work was are, uh, already underway in the ABS or is being planned, which aligns very well uh, with the recommendations that we have developed. Um, so I won't go into detail of the recommendations as there's quite quite a few of them and they're quite specific to the data assets in question, but they were across three categories, uh, metadata generation, the content of metadata and the organization and access of metadata for research analysts. Um, and yeah, the Matt sort of talked talk a little bit about the kinds of things that, that we picked up on here. Um, and when formulating those recommendations, we have considered the roles that the different agencies can play in improving metadata. So including the uh, agencies that generate the data, like the Department of Education in this case, and those that integrate the data, which in this case was the ABS. Um, and we can move to the next slide, please. Um, so the, the final part of the project was a bit different um, and it focused on uh, developing a monitoring and evol evaluation plan to measure the impacts of metadata improvements, uh, the kinds of um, improvements that we recommended in work package four. Um, so, and we looked in terms of improving the core long-term outcomes, things like improved metadata content, better findability of metadata, improved data discovery, um, or more frequent and wider use of the data assets in, in question and improved methodological adequacy of the analysis based on the applied that data. So again, this sort of things that Matt uh, just talked about, uh, making sure that people actually interpret the data in the right way, uh, because um, as, as again, Matt mentioned, this data was not originally created for research purposes, it's it's often a byproduct of, of some sort of administrative process. That's that's there, and the documentation wasn't really kind of prepared with with researchers in in mind originally. Um, so um, to to do this to to have a, a kind of a bit of an approach to to measuring the impacts of metadata data improvement uh, improvements, we first designed a program logic uh, that connected the improvements to metadata and other activities to the core long-term outcomes. Um, and then we also reviewed what the ABS is already um, collecting through things like the user surveys and the operational data in the data lab. Um, and we suggested some ways um, on how some of these data might be able to be used to track the impacts um, of metadata improvements over time. And we can move to... Uh, with I believe will be uh, my last slide, uh, which is just to um, give you a sense of the next steps. So over the past few months, uh, we've been working with the ARDC and several other uh, partners on scoping up the next stages of this work, building on and expanding on the metadata project that we just described. But um, this new program of work will um, be uh, kind of bigger in scope. It will still largely focus on integrated administrative data assets, but will go beyond metadata improvements and will look to improve uh, discoverability of key data assets um, to enhance existing integrated administrative data infrastructure, um, to build capacity among social science researchers, and also to improve engagement and collaboration across the sector. And this new program of work is expected to be announced in the coming uh, in the coming weeks. So um, please stay tuned for that. And uh, with that, I would like to thank everybody for joining us today. And I will now um, hand over back to Mary, who will uh, manage the Q and A part. Thank you.
Oh. No, thank you so much. My check that was that was fantastic. And and to you, Matt, as well. That was great. Um, all right. So I'm I'm curious to see if we've got um any any questions that people would like to ask. Um I don't think I caught anything in the chat, but if you did try earlier, the chat was uh, turned off. So it's now available again if you'd like to add any uh, questions into the chat. Is there anyone who'd like to um, ask any questions from uh, Wojciech or, or Matt? Oh, I think we've got a... All right. Well, we might we might have a bit of a bit of a shorter presentation. Are there any? Um, questions? Yeah, I do have a question. It's an elementary question, but how does one get access to Clyde? It sounds fantastic. Yes. So, uh, Matt, you are like I'm. I'm happy to 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 um start, and and then you can you can add some some something if if needed, Matt. So, uh, look. Uh, so the. The the Plyd data set, yes, it is it is quite an amazing data set. The the access is provided by the ABS. So the first thing that you need to do is to undertake training um to be able to use the data lab environment. So it's basically I think they used to run it as a as a face to face. I think then obviously with COVID they moved it online. I'm not sure whether that's still kind of online. Or, or kind of face to face or online, but basically you you get trained and the training um, covers things like um, uh, the risk of um, re-identification of data and the kind of different um, measures that are in place in the ABS to protect against that you know it covers things like your legal uh responsibilities and the and the penalties including um you know being threatened with jail penalty uh, if you break some of the rules so this is a kind of very secure environment and all the outputs if you if you want so you you kind of you connect remotely um don't you, know, you don't download the data onto your uh, own computer you you just work remotely um Anything you can you, you want to take out of that secure data analysis environment, you need it needs to be cleared. So somebody physically checks the output. So you know you, you might run a statistical model and produce some tables or figures, and those outputs get checked um, for the risk of um, re reidentification and and issues around data um, confidentiality and so on. Because the you know, the ABS takes a very very serious approach to privacy and conf confidentiality of that data. So um, so yeah, so so undertaking the training uh, to access the data lab is is the the key step. Once you've done that, you basically just request um, access to to Plida, which is a modular product. So it involves, um, as I as I mentioned, um, integrated data from multiple government agencies. So for your research projects, you might not need all of those data assets so you, you might be interested in education data only or health data only and then you know you can you can only request that um or parts of the data set so so basically there's a standard application process it gets um it gets um assessed by the abs then gets forwarded to the the data custodians so like the department of health the department of education and so on who then kind of sign off on it um uh, but you know provided that the ABS has reviewed and approved it, you know, you, you will be given given access. So so the training training to work in the data lab is the critical step. So yeah, if you just go to the ABS website, find out about those training courses, um, yeah, you just need to do that. And then and then the application process is again described on the um on the ABS website. You there there are some restrictions in terms of who can access. So if you're affiliated with any university, that's fine. Uh, if if you're affiliated with a government agency, that's fine too. Some other organizations are also um, eligible, but it, it kind of it works on um, yeah, it, it's it's based on the agreements that that the ABS has with different organizations. But it's it's free 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 for with it used to be free. I mean now now it's kind of the pricing model is, is sort of changed a little bit, but it's still basically free for kind of unless you want. Um, but carry 
kind of powerful computer or you have a large um, team of researchers um, but for kind of smaller standards of academic projects they the access um, is is free thank you so much for that uh, Wojtek. Um, I know Matthew mentioned that um, access to the metadata or data dictionary might be limited. You might need to apply, get access before you access the, the data dictionary. Is that still the case? So, or is it yeah. Um, you know, it's it's also, it's changing. Like even since we started this pilot project, like ABS has updated things. So um, I think the, the data item list, so basically the list of variables and a, a short description of each variable, um, is I think available, and I popped a link to the ABS's page about Data Lab in the chat. Um, so those things are usually um, available outside of, like, from the ABS before you get access to it. Um, some of the information about, um, like, coverage of the sample, for instance, um, sometimes like more information about what variables there are what um what portions of the sample are linked together so if you need two different data sort like you want higher education data and tax data they both need and they need to be linked um information about well who is actually linked and who's not linked some of that stuff is not really available until you get um until you actually get into the data lab so it's uh so there's some stuff about the variables broadly um but a lot of times too you just get the variable name and you might not really know what exactly is in there but you know you should if you if you have an idea you should keep checking back because abs really are working on this so um so things do change every you know so often thank you so much oh, thank you that's a great question some great questions there does anyone else have any questions they'd like to ask our speakers today Oh, that might that might be that might be all that we have for today. So oh, I'd just like to say thank you so much for to all of you for joining us today. And I'll just make a few closing remarks. And we hope that we found that you found the discussions and presentations uh, valuable. I know I did. And before we wrap up, I just want to take a moment just to extend a big thank you to our speakers, Professor Wojciech Tomaszewski and Dr. Matt Curry for their presentations today. They were fabulous. So got such an amazing session. So it's great to see the fabulous work that uh, you've achieved with making social science research data more useful and accessible to researchers and even highlighting, up, sort of highlighting even um, the pleated data maybe for the first time for some people in our audience today, which is brilliant. So I'm so incredibly grateful for your time in, um, in joining us to, um, to speak to us about this today. So thank you both so much. So as we conclude, I'd just like to encourage everyone um, to stay connected with us at the ARDC and continue the conversation. Um, there's a few ways to stay uh, in touch and to keep engaged. So um, for the first time ever, International Data Week is coming to Australia, which is absolutely brilliant news. So um, that'll be in October 2025. So that's not October this year, that's next year. So you've got plenty of time to get excited. So if you sign up for some um, for our newsletter, which I'll be able to uh, show you a link to in a moment, um, we'll be able to keep you up to date with, uh, with news and releases about that. You can't even sign up to register yet, but we'll keep you informed of all the exciting updates as they come through. So that's that's us, World Data System, RDA, CoData, all together in Brisbane. So that'll be pretty exciting. Um, another thing um, which, is a, which is fantastic for our early career researchers and managers of data and Indigenous data is the Hassan Indigenous Research Data Commons Computational Skills Summer School. We will do it again in February 2025. Um, we welcomed over 100 um, ECRs and researchers and managers in Indigenous uh, data earlier this year in February. Um, and the summer school is aimed to empower participants with practical knowledge, build digital skills, and help inspire new research research outcomes within, within this wonderful house Indigenous uh, research community. So, can I, sorry, Mary, yes, can I sorry. just jump in and with a little plug, if people are interested in this, um, mm -hmm. our stream, we will be at the um, summer school and 
um, it looks like we'll be offering something about, you know, nothing's finalized, but I think something about introducing um, PLIDA and um, how to use some fake um, administrative data uh, for social science purposes as well. So, And it's it's free to attend, right? Yes, it is. It's free yeah. to attend. That's the best news. It is, it is. It's completely free. Um, it's usually it's usually about three days. It's brilliant. You get to learn how to use um, a lot of services, tools, and and data across the Hassan Indigenous Research Data Commons. And it's great for you know for beginners and for people with a bit of experience. And there's there's all of those six focus areas uh, incorporated into that summer school. So there's something for everyone within the Hassan Indigenous uh, Research Data Commons community so we really encourage you to keep in touch with us and um yes and so you can continue on and and uh we're looking forward to see uh those developments as they come along so i'm really excited to to hear about the the social sciences offering so that's great so that's very exciting um and we'll have more information available about that as it's as as more information is available and uh and here we go so you can subscribe to our newsletter you can like and subscribe to us on LinkedIn, um, you can contact us at contact at ARDC, and um, it'll be yeah. So just feel feel free to keep in contact. And on the Hass and Indigenous Research Data Commons page, you can also sign up to keep in touch with uh, all the latest updates for the Hass Indigenous Research Data Commons as well. So there's two newsletters. So this is you'll be able to find that on that link there as well. So. Um, so that's it. That's all from us. And thank you so much. It's so great to have you all here.